Anyone want to guess where we are today? Why are your people laughing? Where are we? Yes, but we are not in Colossians chapter 3. Well, kind of we are. For those of you that may have jumped ahead and kind of looked over what we might be talking about today, you'll notice in Colossians chapter 4, we have one of those great mysterious oopses when they put the chapters and verses in. That's one of those that you look at and you go, why did they do that? That makes absolutely no sense. Because we look in Colossians chapter 3, and starting in verse 22, Paul says, bond servants, or as we discussed last week, slaves. It says, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive your inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer shall be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Pause. <coughs> Chapter 4 will begin after the intermission. <laughs> Thank you for the intermission. Chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Uh, <coughs> really, they could have moved that one verse down and kept the continuity of thought that would not cause us to get this in two pieces. Now, I kind of cheated a little bit last week, and I, I kind of just wrapped this into what I talked about last week. And just to reiterate, we, we spent last week, we wrapped up interpersonal relationships. When Paul is talking to husbands and wives, parents and children, and slaves and masters, or, or what we would consider in today's society and our culture, employee employers, or employers and who they are working for, the client, the end user. And, and Paul, bringing this all to conclusion, he says, Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Basically, he's saying, yeah, you might be in a position of authority here on earth, but ultimately, all of us are subject to a greater authority. So keep that in mind as you are dealing with those underneath you. Because what, what is kind of unspoken here, what is inferred, is to that master you will give an account. And we talked about that last week as well. That the reason that these are in here is so that we would understand what we will be held accountable for. Okay? Going back to a couple weeks ago, pay attention when it's dealing with you. Okay? Pay more attention when it's dealing with you than when it's dealing with not you. So when it says, husbands, wives, what are you supposed to do? M-Y-O-B. Mind your own business. Husbands, look sharp, pay attention, focus. God is directing this to you, and to this you will be held accountable. Now, and it says wives. Husbands, guess what? You are now off the hook. Because he is not directing this to you, he is directing it to the wives. Now would be a good time, husbands, to go back and review what God has spoken to you. Wives, now God is directing this to you. Pay attention. Because to this you must give an account. Children, again, if you are a child of parents, regardless of your age, pay attention. Pay attention. God is directing things to you. <clears throat> parents, pay attention. Slaves, we're all slaves. We talked about that last week. You know, we all have a master. Whether we choose to acknowledge it or not, we all serve somebody. Somebody. Okay? And Scripture is very clear about how we treat with authority. But in this specific instance, I think he's dealing 
directly to what we would consider employees' employers. Okay? So employees, pay attention. I will address employers in a moment, but for now, pay attention, employees. And then later, he goes to employers. Now, employees, at this point, mind your own business, because it's not for you to point out to the employer, to the master, how they should be dealing with things. Okay? That's the part where we look to the plank in our eye. We deal with that big board in our eye before dealing with the speck in theirs. Trust me, you will never get the plank fully out of your eye in this life. There will always be a plank in your eye. You get one out, and what do you find? There's a whole lumber yard left. There's a lot of planks left. Okay? Masters, pay attention. Employers, because to this, you will give an account. So, last week we kind of wrapped all that up, and this week we're actually going to move on. Now, this, this week is kind of interesting, and the next few weeks are going to be a little bit different, because Paul is really, he's, he's kind of bringing this all to a conclusion. Okay? Everything that he said, he's going to kind of recapsulate, he's going to summarize, he's going to put that nice little footnote at the end. You know, when they teach you how to give a speech, they teach you that it's supposed to be broken down into three parts, right? The intro, the body, the conclusion. In the intro, you tell them what you're going to tell them. In the body. In the body, you tell them. And in the conclusion, you remind them of what you just told them. Okay? And Paul's kind of following that same thing. He's kind of wrapping up and he's pointing back some highlights, some footnotes, some bullet points for us to pay attention to. Okay? So, moving forward. Colossians chapter 4, in verse 2. Paul says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. There's that word again. Thanksgiving. At the same time, Pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Make the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. He's covering a lot of ground in these six verses. And in verse 3, he says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Now, it's, it's kind of funny to me, but if you read through the New Testament, you get this feeling that... Prayer and thanksgiving kind of go hand in hand. Okay? They, they oftentimes, you will see, when they say one, they mention the other. When they talk about the other, it always comes back around to the one. Paul especially does this frequently. Okay? Um, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, Pray without ceasing. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. There it is again. Hand in glove. In Philippians, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in prayer. Hey, hey, there it is again. Um, Paul seems to think that the two should go together, and I think there's a reason for that, very simply. Very simply, I think the reason is that when we are talking to God, the first thing that we should always be mindful of is how so very much he has done for us. How can you not be thankful for the person that has saved your life. Now, I've personally never been in a situation where my life was actually threatened, was in danger. Well, I might have been, and I was just oblivious. The only thing that I can come close to was my dad got tired of how long it was taking me to learn to swim. <laughs> <laughs> and you know the sink-or-swim philosophy? They don't ever tell you what to do when you sink, like a rock. 
So dad picked me up out of the little, you know, two foot kitty area and walked me out to like the five foot end of doom. <laughs> and out I went. And the last thing I remember seeing is the feet of the lifeguard on the little chair that they sat on. I don't, I, I honestly, I don't remember how they got me out of the pool. They may have drained it for all I remember. <laughs> but I do know I got out. That's as close as I've ever come. I don't, if somebody were to save your life, you're trapped in a burning house, whatever. Anytime you think of that person, you're going to think of them with Thanksgiving. Anytime you talk to them, it's going to be with Thanksgiving. Okay? When I was talking about earlier, um, you know, when things are dry, one of the things that I would encourage you to do, besides just spending time alone, start counting your blessings. Start counting the multitudinous ways that God has blessed you. Just, just poured out abundance on you. I mean, yeah, we, we have salvation. I don't know why, but sometimes we get to the point where that's insufficient and it's dry. I, I don't understand that. I think sometimes we just get tired of it. We, we get the, the humdrum, the routine. But what about the blessing of the people in this body that he's blessed us with? What about the job you may have, the house that you live in? The food that you're eating, the clothes that you wear, all of those are His that He has given to you. <clears throat> How about the air that you breathe? You ever appreciate the air that you breathe? If you don't appreciate the air that you breathe here, go live in Houston for a while. <laughs> <clears throat> Two problems. There is no air. <laughs> all they have is sticky, wet stuff, and it stinks. <coughs> be appreciative of things so going back to what he says he says continue in prayer well that means that you're already praying that prayer has already started if prayer has not started for you if you do not have an abundant prayer life You're in trouble. You are weak. How many in here ever had a cast? Arm, leg, whatever. How many of you ever had a cast? Remember what that appendage looked like when it came out of the cast? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay? That's you if you have no prayer life. You have no strength. You have no endurance. You have no ability to cope with whatever is coming at you. So continue in prayer. It's got to start. Start today. Continue in prayer. Continue steadfastly. Don't just pray when things are going well. Or, as is more often the case, don't just pray when things are going poorly. <laughs> Isn't that more often the case? God never hears from us when things are going well. But boy, let something go wrong. <coughs> Barking up the tree. Pray with consistency. Pray with consistency. you got to start somewhere. Start with thanking Him for what He's done for you. Start with thanking Him. How about we start thanking Him for our spouse? How about we start thanking Him for our children? How about we start thanking Him for just the, the simple things in life, like, <coughs> like air? So, continue steadfastly in prayer. we got to start. We've got to be in prayer. Stick with it. <coughs> Being watchful in it with thanksgiving. He's saying pay attention. Being watchful in it with thanksgiving. <coughs> watchful for what? What is he asking us to be watchful for? 
I don't know. I think that's why we're supposed to be watchful. So we'll know it when we see it. I, I, I think, quite honestly, it could be something radically different from me to you. And it might be radically different for me today than for me tomorrow. The point is we always need to be watchful. We need to be paying attention. We need to be paying attention. Okay? So, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. The next verse he says, at the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Now, uh, you know, I, I always check to see, I, I look at other commentaries, uh, I look at uh, people that have insight into the word, I look at uh, different things because I don't want to miss. I don't want my ability to comprehend something to limit me from something. And quite honestly, one of the things that I found that kind of startled me is several people believe that when Paul is saying this, he says, uh, pray that God may open to us a door. Uh, a number of people said that they believe that, that Paul was asking for people to pray that he would be released from prison. I disagree. I don't think that what Paul is asking. Because I believe that Paul is going to preach the gospel wherever he is, whatever situation he is. I think what he's asking is that opportunities would be made available for him to preach the word. You've got to keep in mind, Paul was told that he was going to be enslaved, he was going to be imprisoned, and he was going to be so until he got to speak to who? Caesar. And at this point, we don't believe he'd spoken to Caesar. So if Paul is really asking that he would get out of jail, it seems to me that he's kind of going against what had already been prophesied. And I don't think Paul would really be doing that. That's my own personal opinion. Okay? Feel free to discard it and go, no, he's definitely praying to get out. One of these days we'll find out who was right and who was wrong, and that maybe both of us were wrong. That's okay. My personal opinion is that Paul is asking that he would be made aware of every opportunity to preach the gospel, the mystery of Christ. This is what I believe. That Paul is asking that in the limited situation circumstance that he is in, being in prison, in, in what we would consider house arrest, he would have opportunity to share the gospel. You've got to feel for those guards. You've got to feel for those Roman guards. <clears throat> Because if there's not many people to see, guess who he's preaching to? <laughs> not, not today, Paul. I've, I've had a really rough night. Just please. Oh, I know somebody that can help with that. I, I know, yeah, don't, don't. But really, you need to know this. Paul, if you don't stop, we're going to thump you. Great! 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 <laughs> I consider it a blessing to be accounted worthy to suffer for the cross. Uh, great. <coughs> ah! All right, just tell me and get it over with. <laughs> okay? You, you really, you, Paul is going to do this, but he is asking for prayer. The opportunity would be made available for him to preach the gospel. How does this relate to us? I think what Paul is asking for is fundamental to how we should pray for each other. I, I think it's fundamental. You know, we talk about the Great Commission. And it's called great because it's important, right? And, and that commission is what? Well, that we would go and preach the gospel, right? And actually, that word go, that's really kind of not translated well in the English because the word literally means as you are going. So it's already assumed that you're going. It's not telling you, okay, time to get up and go. He's telling you, as you're going, preach the gospel. Wherever you are, preach the gospel. He doesn't say, you're sitting at home one day and decide, hey, you know what, I'm going to get up and go preach the gospel. Say, no, as you're going, as you're doing things, preach the gospel. 
So wouldn't it make sense then that we should pray for each other that God would open doors for us to be able to preach the gospel, for us to be able to fulfill the commission? Doesn't that make sense? So why don't we do that? How about we just do that? Okay? As part of your regular prayers, pray that doors would be open for you, for me, for others in here, that we might be able to share the gospel, that we might be able to fulfill the Great Commission. Now, watch, there's, there's some other things that he says here that I find really interesting. Okay? To declare the mystery of Christ. What is the mystery of Christ? That is salvation. Okay, that's the mystery. Remember, let's go back to our <coughs> opening thing on Colossians. Paul is dealing with the, the uh, Gnosticism, pre-Gnostic movement, and they've got this whole thing where you got to be on the end to get the mysteries, and they'll be revealed to you once you come in with us. And, and Paul tells them, no, no, no. The only mystery is Christ, and he's revealed that to us, to all of us. You don't have to have a special teacher for this. The special teacher is his spirit that he sent to us after he left. Okay? So he says, the mystery of Christ, salvation. He says, on account of which I am in prison. That I might make it clear. What, what does he want to make clear? That he's in prison? No. That's pretty obvious. He's already repeated that. But that he might make clear the mystery of Christ. Okay? That he might make it understandable. Now, I know probably four or five people in here have already picked up on the memory verses. Have you guys picked up on the flow of the memory verses? <coughs> Anybody? Besides Josh and Nick and Ben. <laughs> and Chris. And Thaddeus. <laughs> Anybody? The Roman drove. Do you see we're working through the Roman drove? Do you understand that? It sets up the principle that we're all sinners. That none of us is righteous. That's the last two weeks. And this week, what did we get this week? Anybody pay attention? Uh, I see you guys looking at your bulletins. <laughs> what, what was it? Ah, yes. Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. This is, this is the natural flow. Okay? See, this is stuff that we need to be familiar with. Okay? We need to have an intimate knowledge of His Word. We have to have an intimate knowledge of what He's done for us. That's why we do the testimonies. We're three for three. <laughs> That's why we do the testimonies up here. We have people come up, not only so that you can be blessed by who comes up up here, but so that the people that come up here have an opportunity, if they've never done it before, they take the opportunity to write out, to really deal with their testimony. This is what God has done for me. Now, we can get caught up in really stupid arguments about the validity of the Word, and we're, believe it or not, our next series, we're actually going to be talking about how we can know the Word is true. Okay? But we can get caught up with people that, that have a lot of fake knowledge, useless knowledge, and, and really serve no purpose. <coughs> well, you, the, yeah, the Bible is just a collection of stories written by a bunch of people a long time ago, and it's really got no more value than the Brothers Grimm. Well, we, we can deal with that. We'll deal with that later. But one of the things they cannot take away from you is your own testimony. What God has done in you. The changes God has wrought in you. Now, they can belittle them. They can think light of them. They can even try to make you doubt them. But if you have a true, life-changing encounter with the ever-living God, that is something no one can take away from you. Okay? Nobody can take that away from you. And it's important that we not only know it, but that we're able to verbalize it. And as Paul says, in a way that is clear... Okay? So, pray for each other that doors would be open. Pray that we would have opportunity, but that we would make use of the opportunity. See, it's not enough just, just to have the door open. It's not sufficient to just have the door open.
When we see the door open, what do we have to do? What's that? We got to go through it. We got to embrace it. We can't go, uh, you know, how many times that there's been a door open and I back off to, oh, I'll pray for that person. I'll pray that somebody, that God will send someone to talk to them. <coughs> Duh. <laughs> he did. And they blew it. Surely there's somebody more qualified than me. I mean, my testimony is kind of weak. I never got into drugs. I never had one of those lifestyles that God had to reach down into the yeah, and pull them out. <laughs> well, yeah, actually I did. I, I did because I was still in the same pit. I just felt like I was more comfortable with it because I didn't do all the bad stuff some of the other people did. But I was still separated by eternity from God. And he still reached eternity to save me. Okay? And I can, without a doubt, confront anybody with the surety of my salvation. Okay? So, not only that the door is open, but we make the most of every opportunity. Now let's, let's move forward here for a little bit because this all wraps up in one thing. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Who are the outsiders? Unbelievers. Yeah, the unsaved. Walk in wisdom toward them. As a matter of fact, Jesus goes even further in, in his understanding of this. He says... Um, that we should be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Okay? And a lot of times people have a difficulty understanding. It's really simple. <coughs> Just because you have faith does not mean you disengage your brain. Okay? That you have to be able to deal intelligently with things. But see, you don't have to worry about that. Because God also provides you with the intelligence. He goes further to say, when you're confronted with these things, don't worry about what you're going to say because the Spirit will give it to you when it's time to say it. Okay? So, all you have to worry about doing is opening the mouth and getting sounds to come out. <laughs> which we have great difficulty doing. God knows what that person needs so much better than you do. Let him speak to them through you. Let him give you the words to speak. Okay? So deal with wisdom with the outsiders. Okay, so the outsiders are those who do not have the light. Right? They're living in darkness. They are separated from God. They don't have his spirit to illuminate life for them. And they just, they, they don't, it doesn't, it's foolishness to them. It doesn't make sense. So we have to deal with wisdom. Now part of that is understanding that they're lost and that they don't have God's Spirit so they're not going to understand the cl with clarity the things that we understand with clarity. You go to your friend that's shacking up with his boyfriend or girlfriend and you tell them you shouldn't do that. They don't understand why. Why should I not do this? Well, because God doesn't want you to. Why? Well, if they even acknowledge that there is a God, that's kind of the first hurdle. If they acknowledge that there is a God, why does he care? What difference does it make? Look, the church's approach is seen entirely wrong for a long time. We want to go out into the world and clean them up. And we want to dress them in tails and prom dresses. That's like going out to the pigsty and pulling a pig out of the mud and dressing them up in a prom dress and thinking they're okay. What you got is now a well-dressed, filthy pig. And see, we go into the world with the same attitude. Hey, if you stop doing this, no, don't do that. You got to quit this. 
What have you got? You've got a well-dressed, filthy pig. Because they don't have salvation. You understand that? What, what we are to do is to present to them the mystery of Christ. But we're, all we're good at is judging them. Are we called to judge them? No. No. Did you realize that, that we are not called to judge the world? Where do we judge? We judge the church. Do you understand that? So when we see the world sinning, we don't have to judge them because they're already judged. God has already made that judgment. If that judgment had not been made, there would never be the need for the cross. So not only did he make the judgment, he made an out for that judgment. So when we as Christians come into it, what do we do? We usurp the place of God and reiterate his work. Oh, that's wrong. Yeah, well, God's already told us that was wrong. That's how you learned it. Okay? So we don't waste time judging the world. They're already judged. They're, as a matter of fact, they're already condemned. Okay? They're already lost. They're dying in their sin. Okay? Let's establish that fact up front. Okay? So what is it for us to do? Jesus made it very simple. When he was in the house of the sinners, and they were saying, Oh, that man eats with sinners. <laughs> Obviously, he cannot be holy. He's, uh, he's in the house with them. And they stood outside the house and called into him, What are you doing in there with sinners? Because <laughs> you know in all of the Jesus movies, they all speak with a British accent. <laughs> <laughs> Okay? So, and they call out, what does Jesus call back to them? He doesn't go, oh, you know what? You're right. I gotta get out of here. No, what does he He calls back to them and he says, I have not come to heal the healthy. I have come to the sick. Those who need help. Those are for whom I have come. To those people. And really, of the two parties, who do you suppose was actually really sick? Well, what both? But the ones to whom received him, he gave the right to develop the children of God. Hmm. Okay? So, our job is to go minister health to the sick. So, now, this is not how you minister health to the sick. Hey, sweetheart, I know you're not feeling well, and I see that your leg has been rent and the blood is flowing out, but I just want to let you know you're alive. <laughs> That's not, that doesn't help anything. The first thing you have to do is understand that they're sick. You have to acknowledge. That's wrong. That's not supposed to be like that. But then you have to administer healing, right? You understand that a lot of times they don't realize they're missing parts. They don't understand that they're sick. They don't even understand, they can't even comprehend that death is all throughout them. They don't understand that. So we have to be able to minister to those that don't even understand they're sick. How do we do that? If they refuse to acknowledge that they're sick, how do you... That's where God's Spirit comes in. Remember it says that no one would be saved but by the drawing of His Spirit. He draws them. Okay? And when He draws them, and when He draws them to you, you better have your med kit ready. Get your tourniquets out. Staunch the flow of blood. You have to be able to know how to minister to them. Amen? Amen. We got a lot that we have to do, so I'm going to cut short a little bit here. Um, there's a couple of verses. You can come up to me afterwards if you want. Um, 2 Timothy 2, 23-26 talks to us about not wasting our time in useless and foolish arguments. Okay? Uh, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, he talks about how he has orchestrated and, and built the body of Christ so that we would no longer be deceived by the futile doctrines and the teachings of the world, but that we would be mature and that we would know who he is and who we are. Okay? 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16 uh, says that, uh, I'm actually going to read this one. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense 
anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Okay? So you've got to be ready. But he doesn't end here because, see, a lot of times we're ready. We're ready. We, we stand here like the old west gunslinger with the gun on our hip. We're ready. Bring it. What? What did you say? What? Let me share with you. And we fill them with the holy bullets. <laughs> Bless you, brother. Bless you, sister. But he goes on. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience. So that when you are slandered, see when, not if, when you are slandered, because there will be those that will slander you. Those who revile your good behavior, those who hate the good things that you do, and there will be those people. Those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Look, we're not called to go toe to toe. We're called to bend down and be a servant to the toe. Okay. So we talked about last week, to be a servant. The example that Christ has set for us. This is the God who came and was made man in human form, who by all rights should have been born supreme emperor of the entire world, which is really only a small area of what he's supreme over, who came and was born to be a servant, to serve us. The example that he set for us, that same thing in the upper room. They're arguing about who's going to be the greatest, who's going to be blah, 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 blah. And they got their heads this big with ideas of themselves. And Jesus totally deflates them because he says, if you want to be great, this is what you have to do. And he gets up and he pulls back his robe and he puts a towel around him and he bends down and he washes their feet. So he didn't just take upon himself the role of a servant uh, because there are even echelons within the servants. You know, you got the top servant, the major domo that kind of directs all the other servants. And we want to be one of those sometimes. Where I don't want to wash the feet and I don't want to serve the drinks because that guy's really particular about how he gets his drinks. So you, you're not quite as high a servant as I am. So you go serve that guy and you, you who are way down underneath me, you can go wash feet. Now, what Jesus did was he said you start at the bottom. That's how true leadership is done by serving, by getting down into the dirty parts, by washing the feet. Okay? That's where true leadership lies in the body of Christ. That is what he has called us to Okay? So, keep in mind, we have to make the most of every opportunity. We have to deal, we have to be wise in how we deal with the world. Don't get caught up in the foolish arguments because there are people that, they, they will waste your time with foolish arguments. Don't get caught up in those foolish arguments. Know where you stand. Know where you stand. Be unshaken. Be unshakable. Matter of fact, Paul tells us that when you've done all that you know to do, stand. Stand firm. Okay? Make the most of the opportunity. Pray that the doors are open. Make use of the doors that are open. Be wise in how you deal with it. Okay? Follow the example that he has given us. Okay?